Hi folks, it's Andrew Kilpatrick here, and this is part six of our series about MIDI. Uh, in this part, we're going to talk about MIDI clock. So let's have a look at the points, and then we'll get right into it. So MIDI clock consists of these five messages. Uh, the first four of these messages are considered system real-time message, uh, messages if you read the MIDI spec. Those, uh, that means that those can occur anywhere in uh, the stream, even in the middle of another message, uh, and those are supposed to be handled with ultimate priority. The fifth message, the song position pointer, is called a system common message, and it's designed to uh, basically let you move back and forth within a song uh, on a sequencer or a drum machine or something like that. So let's go into each of these messages in detail, and we'll talk about some of the implications of them in terms of how uh, devices work together and software and hardware interact and so on. So let's go over to the bench and, uh, and I've got a printout there and we'll, uh, we'll go into it in more detail. So I've divided it in this paper uh, up into the two sections. So the MIDI clock messages really consists, uh, or consist of these four messages here, and the song position pointer is basically uh, used when the sequencer, normally when the sequencer is stopped, to move around in a sequence. Uh, so that, let's say you have two different sequencers, you can keep them synchronized. But let's talk about the, the MIDI clock first. So MIDI clock is a way that we send a timing information between different devices uh, that are supposed to be playing something in sync. So uh, let's start with an example of where you wouldn't need MIDI clock. Um, MIDI clock is only, is not used, let's say, when you have a sequencer playing notes on, on a synthesizer because the timing information about those notes comes from the notes themselves. Um, Everything that the sequencer sends, the uh, synthesizer responds to, and then that's all there is to it. Um, an example of where you would use MIDI clock is if you have sequences or notes being generated by two different devices or different programs. So let's say you have one program that's playing your main sequence and it's triggering patterns on a drum machine. This is probably the most common uh, example. And, the, and you want the drum machine to be able to make its own sequences playback in sync with the main sequencer. And you want it to start and stop uh, when you start and stop the other sequencer and so on. So MIDI clock works in a one-way fashion. One of the devices is the clock master. It generates the clocks. And the other uh, device is uh, receiving the clocks. It would be considered the slave where it would, whatever happens, it would try to, to stay synchronized with the clock messages that are coming in. Now, an important thing about MIDI clock is that the resolution of the clock and how fast it's sent is usually not as much as most sequencers would actually need. And this is a bit of a problem and it causes some, some issues. And I'll get into that uh, right now because this is, this is the most important uh, aspect of using MIDI clock and it's the most source, uh, co uh, common source of problems when trying to get different devices to synchronize between each other. So let's look at a, at a typical example. So the MIDI clock, these are all single byte messages by the way. They don't have any data associated with them. All that gets sent is the status byte which is one of these four bytes. So the timing clock, this is the thing that actually causes time to advance in the, in the sequence. So the timing clock is F8 when it sends that message. There you go, you've got timing going along. In MIDI, timing is sent at a rate of 24 pulses per quarter note. So that's usually uh, usually uh, labeled as PPQ. You might see that in some manuals for some equipment. So every quarter note is divided into 24 parts and the reason why they use a number like 24 is that because it's, it's, it's uh, divisible into both 3 and 4 and you'll see that a lot in timing information. If you look at 
the lengths of uh, notes in a sequencer, the number that's used, usually it's higher than 24, but the number that's used is usually divisible into 3 and 4, and usually other numbers too, like 6 and 8 and other, other numbers like that. Um, so, uh, so 24 pulses per quarter note come along, and those are the things that say, this is time 0, this is time 1, this is time 2, and so on. But the problem with these uh, 24 PPQs is that in some cases, a sequencer, that's all the information it needs. It doesn't need um, really small divisions of time uh, to deal with things like making notes start and stop at a very specific uh, instant. But normally it does. And so what has to happen is when this gets sent from a device, maybe the device internally is working at 96 PPQ or even a higher number like um, 480 PPQ, that's a commonly used number. E software use, uses even bigger numbers because it doesn't really make any difference. Um, but when, he, when you send it over the wire, it definitely makes a difference because you can't just send unlimited numbers of pulses per second or per quarter or whatever because that will just saturate the MIDI connection and that would be bad. So normally the 24 PPQ is the rate that's sent and then it's the job of the receiving side, if it needs more resolution, to measure the time between these pulses. Let's call them pulses because that's really just, they, they're just a single event. Um, and its job is to fill in, let's say it wants to be running at 96 ppq, it needs to fill in the missing events. And that's a bit of a challenge because it needs to be able to measure accurately the, the period of these main pulses. And then it needs to be able to interpolate in between to the other pulses. And there's a little bit of a catch to this. Um, MIDI clock is designed so that you normally send these pulses all the time, even when the sequencer is not running, so that the receiving side has a chance to get locked onto these main pulses and to upsample or develop its higher frequency clocks inside that it's going to use for very fine control of note lengths and things like that. But it seems to be a trend in modern software that when you press stop on your sequencer software, usually in a DAW software, it stops sending all the clocks. And that's really bad because that means that you need to quickly get going if you're the receiver and you need to figure out, oh my god, there's pulses coming in, I'm supposed to be playing now, what, what tempo is it? There is no message here that says that's, this is the tempo. That's, that's an important point about MIDI clock, is that it's just the fact that you're receiving these events at times that are you know, sp spread out hopefully by an even amount of time. Now if there's a tempo change, obviously the period would sl slowly change, or hopefully slowly change, and give the receiver time to adjust its uh, internal clocks so that these little in-between pulses are generated at the right speed. So you can see this could be a challenge if you're a designer and you're trying to make a system that works like this. Um, let's talk about these other three messages here for a second, the start, continue, and stop. So remember when I said that normally this clock is designed to be running all the time, these messages are the messages that are basically like the buttons on your tape transport that you might be familiar with in most music software, most uh, you know, hardware sequencers have buttons that are similar to this. So when you press, uh, when, you, when you get a start message, start means go back to the very beginning of the, of the song. And that means, that's kind of like saying reset our position. So when you receive a start message, it will go back to the song, and then when it gets the next clock pulse, the F8 timing clock, then it will start, it'll say that's, that's zero. So this is kind of like gets it queued up and waiting. Uh, conversely, stop means stop receiving clock pulses. So if you're in a stop state, any of these pulses that come in might continue to keep your clock synchronized, but they're not going to uh, actually cause the sequencer to advance at all. 
Um, and then continue is like start, except it doesn't change the position. So continue would be like pause and unpause. Start would be like rewind to the start. Um, the names here don't, you know, they're kind of like not what we would normally think of when we're thinking of actual equipment, but that's the function that they have. So stop would be like kind of like, stop is more like pause really. Stop doesn't, you know, stop everything and, and it just stops playing and the position is, is, is retained. So that's like pause. Continue is like unpause basically. Um, and then start is like continue, except it, before it continues, it resets the playback position. So this, these, are, these are sort of the, the key ingredients to clocks uh, and how they should work. If you're making software or making gear, it's a good idea to make sure that it sends the clocks all the time, even if, they're, if the sequencer is stopped. That's a, that's a nice thing to do for someone who's receiving. And if you've written a, a MIDI clock receiver code, uh, I've spent quite a lot of time on this myself. Uh, you'll know that if you receive clocks all the time, it makes the whole job a lot easier to stay synchronized. If you're not receiving clocks all the time, then what you have to do is you have to very quickly figure out the duration between these uh, clocks and try to figure out how fast you should run your internal clock. And then you have to make slow adjustments so that it doesn't kind of waver all over the place. So if you have devices with that when they start playing together, they kind of seem to be a, lot, a little bit out of sync and then they get back into sync or the tempo kinds of, kind of drifts, that's something to look at. Um, if you see that, you know, there's no MIDI being sent when your sequencer is stopped, that's a good thing you should maybe ask the person who made the sequencer, hey, you know, why does it stop sending when it stopped or is there an option to adjust that or something like that? So that brings us to the song position pointer. And the song position pointer, uh, although this is not that much implemented in, in many kinds of equipment, especially things like pattern-based sequencers and loop-based sequencers. This doesn't really work that well. Um, one of the problems with song position pointer is it sort of assumes a linear progression of time, more like a tape recorder or like an old school sequencer interface. Um, not this kind of idea of the, you know, the new style of, of looping tracks and so on. But basically what the song position pointer does is it lets us kind of move back and forth within the sequence so that when we want to rewind, we don't have to use start to rewind all the way to the beginning. We can, we can rewind or fast forward to another point within the sequence. And this uses both data bytes so that there's uh, basically uh, 16,384 possible values, including zero. And those are values basically in 16th notes. If there's 24 pulses per quarter note, a 16th note has a value of six pulses. And so to make this number work over a longer period of musical time, they basically said, well, you can't synchronize to an exact pulse. You can only synchronize to every six clock pulses. So it's kind of a bit of a trade-off, but it's, the idea is, you know, if you want to reset your sequencer to a particular bar or a particular beat or even a smaller amount, like a 16th note within a beat, that's all possible using the song position pointer. So what's supposed to happen is when a device receives this, it's supposed to move its playhead, let's say, to the point that matches this particular point in time measuring from the beginning of the song and then when it starts to get a, a continue message it's supposed to start playing from that position and hopefully if everything is is working well that hopefully both sequencers or multiple sequencers will all begin playback at the same time. Um, I would say that the 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 uh, success rate of using this in the modern days with a lot of devices that use MIDI clock for various things, um, but not necessarily for sort of linear sequencer things, don't expect this to work perfectly. Um, things like arpeggiators, that's a good example of something that might use a timing clock or a pattern based sequencer or a step sequencer that has a MIDI uh, clock support. Um, those are things that, that definitely use some or all of these messages, 
but probably maybe don't use this or they don't implement it in a way that would be useful if you're trying to synchronize a long song, let's say. So that's basically the idea of MIDI clock. Um, MIDI messages are real-time messages, which means uh, these, these clock messages can come anywhere in a data stream, uh, even in the middle of another message, and they're supposed to be handled sort of immediately um, and so on. Um, and uh, that's basically how it works. So I hope that uh, shed some light on uh, MIDI clock. If you have more specific uh, questions about it, let me know and I'll try to do a more specific video about that. Um, it's a complicated topic. Uh, I just sort of glossed over it in, uh, in the, the sort of top level details. But if you're implementing a system like that, um, let me know and I might be able to shed some light on it because uh, I've spent quite a bit of time uh, messing around with uh, MIDI clock code and so on. The devil's definitely in the details. Uh, the protocol looks simple, but the problem is that actually getting things to work together and implementing it in a really neat and tidy way is, uh, is a bit of a challenge. So I hope that this uh, sheds some light on how MIDI clock works and, uh, and maybe some of its limitations. And I hope that you'll uh, subscribe to this channel and join me for the next video. Thanks.